Life's a game, the world's a stage, and we are merely role players, where theatrical people play role playing games. I'm Matt Boothman, and I'm your compere for this main house production. Here on Merely Role Players, we improvise stories for your entertainment and ours, and we use role playing games to keep the story going places even we can't see coming, because as theatrical people, we're all about maximising the drama. This episode is part of our current main house production, Vigil, Tourist Trap. In this production, we're playing Monster of the Week, a role-playing game by Michael Sands, published by Evil Hat. So please take your seats in the main house. Tonight's production is about to begin. Vigil a Merely Role Players main house production. Tourist Trap, Act 5 of 5. I'm Helen Stratton and I play Melody, the Constructed. She owns Sherry Downs Cafe Cum Record Shop and knows how to handle a tough customer. She's got a heart of gold, which just so happens to be secondhand. I'm Chris Buxy and I play Calisterius Softbinding, the expert. Calisterius, or Cal to his friends, is a noted horror writer living in Sherrydown. While researching his latest novel, he discovered that monsters were real. He also discovered that fighting monsters is an excellent way to procrastinate when he really should be writing. My name's Chris McLennan and I'm playing Ed Kincaid, the professional. He's a disgraced MI5 agent who's been kicked down to a basement to investigate reports of ghosts and little green men and other things that definitely don't exist. He just wants to file his report and go home. I'm Ellen, and I play Jess Butterworth, the spooky. Jess is a Sheridan local born and bred. A voice in the back of her mind keeps telling her she's bigger and better than this town. It's about time Jess showed Sheridan how badly it's underestimated her. It's a gingerbread house, basically. Um, this is date to devour the unwary. And if it is in town, I bet it's in that shop. Maybe you could make some sort of bargain with it. I bet it knows things. You're so right. Open up! Open up, you swindlers! Would you like to complain to the manager? Damn right I do. Are they going to play? Will they tell us stuff? All of this digital data flows through Kit and into you and you suddenly know things. The back of the shop and the counter where Charlie went through the door suddenly rush towards the windows. The shop turns inside out, a story high hermit crab-like creature. Charlie Barlow lands and rolls and he looks pretty injured. It swivels in place and takes off down the main street towards that vape shop that you imagined. I'm not sure that's going to fit in the dungeon, guys. Well, I don't think it's heading there, so I don't think that's much of a problem. <laughs> and uh, uh, leg it back towards the boot of the Morris. Grab, grab the shotgun out the back. Have you got any rope in the back of the car? I think, I think given, that, given that there is a live capture policy, there must be something with which you might be able to. I like the idea that you've got like a little butterfly net in there as well. Yeah. Because this is Some, not what you're expecting. Small. Exactly, exactly. Um, I might just have to stand there and think because I've got a few things that I can do. And then I would shout to Ed once he's at the boot of the car to chuck me some rope and catch that. And 
<laughs> there's so many things that I could do with it that would be really silly. I think um, Ed's off down the street doing that uh, cool, well, what he believes looks like that cool slow-mo shot in most uh, cop films near the end where they're running and putting the best, like the, the tactical bests on while sprinting towards problem. Uh, this thing is moving at a pretty yeah. fast speed. Uh, you can see cobbles have come loose from the main street where its sharp feet have dug in. Okay, so I'm going to be running after it. Now, Cal has said that we we probably can't put it in the in the library dungeon. Then capturing it seems like a bad call. We can't let this. Uh... <laughs> Roam around from shop to shop. The high street's in enough trouble already without this thing uh, um, <laughs> destroying Without all the shops. giant sentient crab shops. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to try and attack it then. I'm gonna have to try and kick some kick some ass. So it's got wires where its organs would be. I think I would like to take a sledgehammer to there. I'm gonna roll now. Yeah, go for it. Roll plus tough. <laughs> So uh, let, let's try and get this right first time, shall we? My tough is plus two. Eight. I'm on ten. Amazing. Yeah. So what does the... How much harm does the sledgehammer do? <laughs> I'm laughing because it's good. It's three harm, hand heavy, messy. <laughs> Every, everyone's favourite combination of anything. Great. And which extra option from the kicks a mass move would you like... I'm um, gaining the advantage, please. So I think what you do here is smash one of its legs. Lovely. How many legs does it have? Eight. Oh. Has it got eight and pincers? Yep. Horrible. That's so rude. <laughs> so rude of it. Okay. How dare it. Melody sprints after the, the fleeing tourist trap, brandishing... Bruce? wielding Bruce, swinging Bruce and with pinpoint accuracy slams it into one of the back knees of this fleeing creature there's no sound it doesn't chitter, it doesn't make any noise, but it flails and one of its other back legs spears towards you in retaliation for three harm <laughs> oh dear not quite pinning you, but scraping down the length of your body with this sharp foot. Ugh. Okay. And you did feel uh, some resistance from its uh, shiny black shell as you smashed it with the yeah. hammer. It stops and skitters around in place again, trying to pinpoint the threat. It's now decided that if it's under attack, it should deal with that before getting into its new nest. I think I'm going to try a bit of magic, a bit of offensive magic. Um, as I didn't get to do the ritual, I'm going to try and just um, something a lot more uh, straightforward. I'm just going to conjure a fireball and lob it directly at the crab. So what this looks like is, again, I sprinkle out a little bit of the, uh, the nameless dust from my juju bag onto my hand, rub my hands together, they appear to sort of burst into flames and then I just heave this fireball at the crab. Um, so I'm going to roll uh, weird which is going to be plus one and uh, an additional plus one for my preparedness in my mystical library. So I'm now prepared to burn some crab. Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Right, five, six, seven. Do you know what? I think I'm going to use a point of luck to turn this into a, a twelve. Okay. The effect goes off without a hitch. Excellent. Okay, so this um, huge uh, fireball, it sort of grows as it leaves my hand uh, straight up. My aim is good. It smacks straight into uh, where we think its face might be. <laughs> hey, stop being so shellfish. Uh, and that is one harm, ignore armor. Magic, obvious. <laughs> I think part of the obvious is that you blow out some other nearby shop windows <laughs> okay uh, and a car alarm nearby starts going off okay i can live with that <laughs> along the high street shop proprietors are poking their heads out of their shops that they were in the middle of opening seeing what's going on and immediately poking back in again and taking shelter in their shops 
<laughs> turning signs to closed. <laughs> yes, turning the signs to closed. <laughs> Seeing Melody get hit, um, getting in there, assault rifle styling, shooting at the bits of the legs, just moving towards it, going to try and drag Melody out of there while doing some damage to this thing. It, it seemed to work, whatever Melody did, even if it did piss it off, so <laughs> get it back, but from a little bit further away. <laughs> so, uh, roll plus tough. Uh, that is an eight. So, normally this would mean you do your damage to it and it does its damage to you, but you're a little further away and it can't actually reach you from where it is. So you're just going to deal your harm. Uh, so that's uh, three harm. Three harm, minus one for its armour. Where do you hit it? Do you smash another couple of legs? Yeah, I'm basically like aiming for the sort of joints of the legs where the clumped up sort of wiring is, because that seemed to bring it down. I, w I want it to not be able to move too well, because getting somebody out of the vicinity of it is worthwhile, <laughs> rather than just a, a minor stalling tactic. Yeah. It flails again and raises its broken legs as best it can off the ground, so it's just standing on the, the remaining uninjured ones and starts moving in all of your direction, claws out as if to scoop you all up in its way. I think Jess has sort of been a bit in shell shock from the data dump on top of the car and has sort of staggered, maybe gone to her knees a little bit. She hasn't, isn't necessarily aware that Melody's injured or anything. Um, and perhaps there's like a, a moment where this influence sort of lifts and yes, she's got the information that she wanted but maybe now she's realized what she's actually done which is give it an aim to go somewhere else so that we can no longer take it by surprise and she's gonna jump off the car reach into her bag and she's got her brother's old doom gun it's a nine millimeter she's tried to practice shooting it out in the woods by herself and she's gonna aim it between the pincers where she thinks the face brain might be. Go ahead, roll plus tough. Oh, seven. You get your shot off. What? How much damage does the pistol do? Uh, two. Okay, taken down to one by its armor. You hit it where you wanted to hit it. Okay. But it doesn't stop. The pistol doesn't have enough stopping power to stop a creature of this size from coming towards you. And it scoops you up in its pincer from the, your perch on the top of the car. No. Uh, Ed would like to try and jump up on the pincer if it comes anywhere near him. Okay. Not between the snippy bits, ideally. Mm -hmm. On top. <laughs> do you want to try and make that a protect? Uh, no, I think he wants to get on and do some damage. Right, okay. I mean, I guess it will part protect, but I don't think that's his initial intention. That was my plan before she got grabbed, so I guess it's not. Jess, you take three harm as you feel the pincer Ooh. bite into your midsection. Oh, ouch. Okay. And you're lifted off the ground. Your arms are free, right. but you are in the air being held securely by this creature. Okay. Chris, uh, roll act under pressure. You're damn right, I am. Uh, jump up onto this claw. That's a nine, so I'm going to bottle one up so it goes up to a ten for a full success. Is that right? Yep, perfect. You've managed to avoid being pincered. You're now standing on the joint, maybe one leg on each of the... Yeah, I'm legs. looking for anything similar to on the legs, but on the on the pincer arm. Uh, and I'm yeah. just going to... For the, shotgun hanging at my side i'm just gonna just empty it into that basically yeah the pincer arm definitely has uh the same sorts of joints yeah. uh that you can aim for so roll plus tough uh it's a nine okay the shotgun goes off blasts into the joint of this pincer does it whack you with the other pincer that's holding jess or is it that you blow this pincer you're standing on apart and therefore fall and hit the cobbles. I think the second one. Okay. You blast this pincer apart. Both of the hinged parts of it come away from the arm uh, in a shower of sparks. And now left with nowhere to stand, Kincaid falls 
and lands on the cobbles and bounces for one harm ignore armor. Oh, not ignore armor. <laughs> I was like, it's fine. I could do this. I'm wearing armor. This stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't help when you hit the ground. Uh, but yeah, it's lost that claw now. Um, and it's looking, in fact, incredibly badly hurt. It is now starting to lurch from side to side in much the way that the small one in uh, Amazement Park did. It lurches to one side and smashes the front of another shop. You hear screams from inside, staggers to the other side drunkenly. I'd like to uh, draw my silver sword and attempt to sort of try and hack off the pincer arm that's holding uh, Jess. Nice. Roll kicks some ass. Okay. Plus tough. So uh, this is plus zero. Uh, oh, five. Mark experience. Okay. Calisterius comes swinging in with the silver sword at this pincer, but with whatever senses it's using, it sees you coming, and before you know it, there's a leg spearing down towards you. Oh my god. You guys. Um, <laughs> sorry, I protect one of you. Right, well, Jess has already got three harm, so I'm going to try, <laughs> try and stop one of us having three harm. Um, I suppose it's just a case of be getting in my way and probably just blind virtually just blindly swinging yeah you you could you could shoulder charge him out of the way oh. you could just yell a warning as this as this leg is piercing down at him from behind yeah okay i will just yeah all right roll plus tough and you get plus one for your purpose being protection nine you protect them okay, but you're going to take some or all of the harm. <laughs> do I decide it was... I think it's some of the harm, not all of the harm. What do you think? <laughs> I, well, because my intention was just to be... Just to shout, Cal, behind you! I don't know if it would make sense for me to end up getting all of the harm. <laughs> <laughs> well argued. Just... I think be because of the role, I think it had to have been... There had to have been a physical element to this. You have to have been running okay. in. So... You yell and charge, yep. and Cal stops, and the leg uh, does not pierce him. It doesn't fully pierce you either because it wasn't aiming for you. Okay. You're an extra element, but it does still do two mm. harm. Okay. That puts me on five of seven, by the way, everyone. Ooh, okay. So it comes down and it, it staples your foot Ooh. to the street. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just detach that. I'm just going to leave, um, how much of it is it sensible to leave behind? Not a lot, obviously none. Just step one out, I realise. <laughs> well, as you can, I would, I would have thought. Okay, so I'm going to step away and I'm probably going to fall down and be pushing myself backwards while leg foot is trying to get itself free. <laughs> well, Melody, thank you. <laughs> Are you okay? What stupid question? Go and do something. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Ed just sees the leg come off. Doesn't really know what he's seeing from a distance and having just clattered to the cobbles, he thinks her leg's been ripped off. <laughs> and uh, he's up and on his feet and heading over there as guns blazing as he could possibly be. Uh, is Jess still in the pincer? I'm still here. Yeah, okay. Then in that case, he's just walking towards the pincer and, and blasting. Right, roll plus tough. Please mind the Jess. <laughs> uh, it's 12. Nice. So which extra benefit from Kicks and Mass would you like? Inflict terrible harm, I think. Nice. Uh, it's the assault rifle again now. Uh, it's uh, three harm. Three harm plus it terrible harm makes it four. Tell us how you take this thing down. Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty blind fire. I think he's just walking, just firing at this pincer, like, and just reloading and firing and reloading and firing. Because it, I think he thinks uh, Melody's done for, and uh, it's sort of a, a white rage. But yeah, I figure the pincer breaks off at some point and uh, falls to the ground, which is probably not great for Jess, but yeah, I think it would break her fall somewhat, at least. But then I think just the, the creature starts... Like it, like it has been when it's taken wins before, just sort of staggering around and just trying to take sort of swipes at whatever it can, but they're sort of half-hearted at this point as it sort of just 
winds down and after a few seconds of stillness just put like its body just plummets into the cobblestones and uh it just sort of sinks a lot of its body just starts to puddle like the smaller one did before but the hard carapace of the legs seems to stay solid but the bundles of wiring that form its muscles just start to sort of split and fray and spin apart so the end result is it it looks like there's been some sort of like industrial accident on market street there is a spill of some weird looking goo and there are these mechanical looking bits of metal and wiring scattered about melody your removed leg is free the staggering around of the of the crab in its death throes unpinned it from the from the street but uh melody your wounds are not going to heal by themselves charlie barlow is also still lying in front of the shattered previous shop front nest of the creature slowly trying to drag himself towards melodies do i know sort of the deal with melody can i can i attempt the the sort of magic to heal her i think probably not i'm guessing i'll sort of run over and realize okay your leg's off she's got a leg off but um <laughs> there's no blood right noted you've got a leg off just yeah. write that down <laughs> but i can clearly see it's you know not a normal injury i know that, that there's something up so i i just look at melody and go uh wow okay that looks like enough to make anybody crabby are you okay go enough with the jokes i just help help me get back in the cafe will you sorry it's how i deal with stress i'm sorry <laughs> Uh, shall I pick up you or the leg? You pick me up, the leg will follow. Okay, right, great. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. I, I get my lady's arm around uh, my shoulder and sort of help her over into the back into her cafe. Well, I don't, I don't know how far we are because I felt like the creature ran fast and therefore I thought far, but then, yeah, I just don't know how far away we are now. It's probably it's it's a it's a bit of a hobble. Okay. Like it's not it's not just it's not just next door, but you can definitely make it now that there isn't a, an immediate threat. Yeah. I think I'm sort of collecting himself as he's uh, Melly head down the street with Cal, and he's just making the follow when the leg comes past him. <laughs> and I think I think he'd just pass out <laughs> in front of this giant crab wreck. <laughs> it's just too much. And Jess, as you disentangle yourself from this claw that's no longer holding you quite so uh, hard, what do you do? Um, I think I'm going to see that, that Melody's being looked after and I'm going to make a beeline for Charlie on the floor outside the shop. Um, you know, I can go at a fair pace. I'm not too injured. So I kind of stumble along behind everyone, but stop at Charlie. Charlie needs an ambulance. Right. I'm going to call him an ambulance immediately. Jess, can you... Can you open park tomorrow? Charlie, don't worry about the park right now, OK? The park's going to be fine. You just you just concentrate on staying nice and still for me, all right? Sheridan is twinned with Waterdeep, City of Splendours. Right now in Waterdeep, the great game is afoot. Plan your trip to this bustling metropolis now, and you could be in with a chance to grab the biggest hoard of gold ever gathered in all the realms. Sheridan Town Council does not recommend planning an actual trip to bustling Waterdeep during the great game. The great game has a high mortality rate, and anyone visiting Waterdeep during this season does so at their own risk. As a, a, um, a safe alternative, the council recommends becoming a patron of our town's favourite great game contestants, the Waterdeep Mole Rats. Your support could mean everything to these plucky heroes of the Dock Ward. Literally, your influence could mean the difference between rescue and betrayal, between a daring heist succeeding or failing, between the Mole Rats winning the prize, or losing everything. 
Enjoy the beautiful but dangerous city of Waterdeep from a safe distance, Mondays at 7pm UTC plus 1 on twitch.tv slash sabotage the DM. Hello everyone and welcome to the Waterdeep Mall Rats Dragon Heist podcast. And as she's like crossing over, she's like pulling out an empty jar, just like, yes, I want you. (laughs) I want to study you so hard. This audio is taken directly from our live stream, which you can see on twitch.tv forward slash sabotage the DM on Mondays at 7pm in the UK or 11am Pacific Standard Time. You know what we used to do when we were fighting and we were scared? We used to smoke. Here you go. (laughs) Out of that taste. Our adventure will be played by a cast of immersive actors. Dan Berman, Pups the Goblin Monk. Gabrielle McPherson, Oshie Sota, the Yuanti Pureblood Rogue. Rob Thompson, Big Fatch, the Warforged Barbarian. And Evie James, Baggy, the Half-Orc Artificer. She's going to try and steal it all off the table as much as she can get. <laughs> and then run, okay? Towards Ship Street. Ready? Oh, she's pissed. We will join our adventurers as they move from their homes on Black Star Lane in the Dock Ward and attempt to climb into the higher echelons of Waterdeep society to join what is known as the Great Game or the Never Ember Enigma. In search of hundreds of thousands of stolen gold coins hidden somewhere in the city. Oh, I don't know. Why, what is it with pups and shit, man? <laughs> <laughs> All right, lovies. It's me, Matt, your compere, asking you to please make sure you return to the correct seat after this final interval of the production. First, let's take a look through the programme, shall we? As you already know, this is the final act of Vigil Tourist Trap. Next week, we'll head backstage for a post-show discussion with the cast to wrap up the production. Then, as usual, we're closing the main house and opening up the studio. That production will be The First Nova, a star fantasy in three acts. We'll follow the ragtag crew of the Mustang Sally as they explore the wreck of the legendary starship Trinary Noon. The wreck contains secrets some say could turn the tide against the oppressive mandate that rules the galaxy. But our heroes might have just led the mandate right to it. We'll be playing Galactic, a role-playing game by Riley Rathal, inspired by Star Wars and focused on interpersonal relationships, i.e. drama, i.e. everything we like here on Merely Roleplayers. Galactic uses a system created by Avery Alder, sometimes called Belonging Outside Belonging, and sometimes called No Dice, No Masters. As that name suggests, it doesn't use dice or any kind of randomness and doesn't have a game master role, which means I get to play a character in this one. He's got four arms and feathers. You might have heard Josh, Strat, Nat and I playing a belonging outside belonging game before. We played Sleepaway by Jay Dragon when we appeared as guests on the What Am I Rolling podcast in 2020. In case you missed it back then, I'll link to those episodes in the program notes. We had a great time as guests of Fiona, the host of What Am I Rolling? And now it's our turn to play host, because Fiona's joining us for the first Nova, playing a genius mechanic and ace pilot. The first Nova will also feature a new addition to our regular cast, Marta da Silva. Marta makes her merely roleplayer's debut as a capable ex-member of the Mandate, trying to find their place in the galaxy. I'm really pleased with this production. There's something about a well-written belonging outside belonging game that can't fail to bring out the big emotional moments. You're not going to want to miss this one. Steering gently back to our seats and back to the production at hand, though, I hope you've enjoyed Taurus Trap, and that you'll side-eye the next tacky souvenir shop you spot on your local high street. Now that all five acts are out, it's the perfect time to tell a friend you enjoyed it and encourage them to binge the whole thing. Or, if you prefer, you could tell multiple strangers by leaving us a five-star rating and a few nice words on Podchaser or Apple Podcasts. As far as I'm aware, the last time someone left us a review was April 2020, and I'd love to get at least one review in 2021. It could be you. 
First, though, of course, you'll want to know how this story ends. So please take your seats once again in the main house for the conclusion of Vigil Tourist Trap. Melody, Cal helps you into the shop. You can feel that the injuries that you've sustained, obviously you're, you're on one leg at the moment, your other leg is crawling along the street, also towards the shop behind you to, to join the rest of you. Of course. And you, you know that the, the injuries that you've sustained are serious enough that they will get worse before they get better. Unless you expose yourself to the the force that animates your form uh, in in quite a large concentration, I think the first thing I would want to do would be to reattach my leg, and I haven't really thought about how how that works, particularly other than like like a popping it back on situation. But that doesn't fit with me being sufficiently injured. Uh, maybe I can attach it, but it still doesn't work so great yeah or or maybe you you can get it positioned but it won't take like it won't yeah. it won't adhere until uh that fo- that animating force is running back through you again that works that makes sense okay so then uh, <laughs> i think the most efficient way for melody to do this is go into the music shop part of the establishment and play multiple records on different players at the same time and set the tape there's two or three tape players as well she likes tapes um put those on and then put them all really loud and lie on the floor when you get into the shop do you just sort of immediately go off and start doing all of this stuff or do you kind of direct Cal to help you with anything? No, I think I would just do it. I think um, I think Cal's going to ask too many questions <laughs> and it's not going to even occur to me that I should provide some sort of explanation. Just getting on with it. Cal sort of walks over a bit gingerly and says, uh, would it help if I sung that song about the knee bone being connected to the thigh bone? <laughs> It's, it is, I don't think it's going to hurt, but how is your singing? Uh, not very good. Could it cause more damage, potentially, if I'm not a good singer? <laughs> Please do no, um, it can't cause more damage. I'll be quite all right with what I've got, um, so it's up to you. Okay. And then I think Cal's just going to sort of sit in the corner, humming gently to himself and just watching uh, what's happening. <laughs> Jess and Ed... From outside, from on the street, you hear this weird medley coming from Melody's of several different random records, the first things that Melody could find in the racks, all playing at once. like medley is a generous, a generous description of what would happen if you brought a of players and changed it once. I think that's enough to bring Ed around from his uh, recent fainting escapade. Yeah, there is an alarm clock sort of quality to the sound. Yeah, it's amazing, <laughs> horrible night. Oh, fucking jazz. I hate jazz. <laughs> Starts to clamber to his feet. I think Jess is... She's just watching the ambulance drive off with Charlie, who hopefully is going to be okay. And this noise starts behind her. She turns around and makes eye contact with Ed. <laughs> needs to find out what on earth is going on. She thinks, oh god, it's not another bloody monster. What is the state of the street currently, like, crab detroit wise So there is miscellaneous sort of metallic debris that formed part of its shell and part of its legs, uh, which looks like kind of maybe, it looks kind of like car wreckage. Um, a lot of the cobbled street is is pitted with small craters where its legs have dug in and many of the local shop fronts are smashed and the bits of like shop or car or whatever that were making it up do they now look like bits of shop and car or are they 
like did the did the bits of detritus sort of form into crab bits or were they like plating uh they they were part of the creature but they they were metal rather than anything organic yeah. so i don't know i don't know whether it formed those from like the industrial bits in the back of the shop front it was inhabiting I think Ed's just trying to pick over in his mind what he's what he's going to have to tell people <laughs> who's gone on here. If we can make out that most of the debris is from like an explosion or something like that, then that's that's better than crab. It's one step up from crab. <laughs> yeah, like framing this scene in your mind, yeah. thinking like if this was on the front page, what would it look? What would they be saying? <laughs> yeah, it is. What would it look like? <laughs> that's what he does. He cuts a picture out of a nearby newspaper he finds on a bench and holds it up. So there's a gap around the scene. Goes, right, I think that's about. Helen, do you have an idea in your head of what it might feel like to Melody as she's she's surrounded by this nice analog music, the exact kind of music that she wants and needs, as that starts to like flow through her, reanimate, knit her back together. Um, like the bad kind of pins of needles that mm. hurt slightly where it's really having to mesh and work. And then just like more regular pins and needles where it's just charging. I think maybe from lying on my floor and Cal sat there rocking backwards and forwards or singing or whatever, whatever coping Cal's trying to do. I'll be like, Cal? Yes? Thanks, Cal. That's okay. Any time. <laughs> so, clean up aftermath. This is a chance to get into like what what are MI five's actual responsibilities in a situation like this, or, or your unit of MI five. How much of the clean up is your responsibility, and how much of it is just you need to phone it in to somebody? let them know that something has happened and then wash your hands I of it. I think I need to phone it in. I don't think anything to this magnitude has happened before that requires this much. Like, normally I'd be able to sort it, report something, and be done with it, whereas this is probably going to need a bit more of a presence on the scene. So I think they're probably going to be as surprised about having to do anything for this department as I am about having to make the call. So there's a there's a number in your phone that you haven't had to dial in a while, or maybe maybe have never dialed because you're so good at explaining every situation away to yourself as not being supernatural. Often also in the past, I think they've been supernatural things, but they've not been like wrecking a town. It's been like something weird going on and a couple of people have experienced something, you know, peripheral to it. Whereas this is a bit more like, uh, might a uh, might have to call the call the wolf. So we know from your character creation that you have hostile superiors. There are people above you in MI5 who do not like you, and that's why you're on this detail in the first place. How how long after Kincaid woke up in the street uh, is this, and where is Kincaid when he makes this call? I think he would uh, head down somewhere, like away from town a bit, is there a lake? Lake or a river? Sure. Yeah, let's have a lake. Lake, reservoir, something like that. Why not? Oh, reservoir. I like reservoir. Yeah, reservoir. It's sunny yet windy. And so you sort of the, the wind stirs Kincaid's suit jacket as he dials this number that he rarely dials. The person on the other end picks up and says nothing. You, you hear that the line is connected, but they're waiting for you to speak. Never thought I'd say this, but I think uh, I think we might have some work to do. Are you there? Kincaid, you're not supposed to use this number except in exceptional circumstances, you know that. Well, do you think I want to talk to you? I think there's pretty exceptional circumstances. Explain then, make it quick. Okay, well, uh, quick. Uh, Giant shopfront crab monsters terrify small town. And did you follow protocol? Do you have the creature in custody? He looks down at the, the little figurine and goes, 
I've, I've got something. Roll deal with the agency, which is a professional move that is a roll plus sharp. Uh, it's going to, that's a 10, so 11. So that means that you're good. If we could characterize this as a slip up, it goes unnoticed. Uh, whatever it is that you need to request to make a success of this scene uh, is okayed. As long as it's just this once, don't make a habit of it. What do you need? Clean up mainly, I think. I don't think I'm going to be able to keep this under wraps all by myself. There's a. We've got goo, we've got debris, we've got many witnesses and uh, a potentially volatile and he looks back down at the figurine situation the team is on the way make it snappy as crowds are starting to form and don't think the old swamp gas off of venus trick's gonna cut it this time don't push your luck Kincaid. you can't order me about you hangs up he looks at the reservoir looks at the figurine considers it and then just puts it in the jacket pocket and heads back towards the Morris. I think he'll head back to the to the B and B uh, and have a sit and a think, and gather his things, his, his go stuff. I don't think he gets to. I don't think he probably gets to leave if he's called a team in. I think he probably has to be there. You've had to do more monster hunting than you than you like to do, which is any, and also. You thought you'd be out of this town yesterday evening, and you're still here. Yeah, and he's. I think he's re reluctant to sort of go about doing much in case it escalates any further. I think he basically was to keep an eye on this thing, make sure it doesn't take over anything else or him, steal his identity. He doesn't pay for anything on a card or using his mobile. It's hard to be Kincaid. <laughs> <laughs> It's a few days later, it's a quiet afternoon at the Duck and Parsnip, and Jess is taking a shift behind the bar when Cal walks in. Hi Jess, uh, just a pint of the usual please. Right Cal, coming up. So, uh, I don't know if you've reached the same conclusion as I have, but, and then I sort of take out a... Uh, an old leather-bound sort of small notebook from my pocket and just put it down on the bar between us. Um, and it's titled uh, Rituals of the Order of the Endless Night. I thought we were both out, but seeing that they already said they were going to do something like that, I don't know, this just seems a bit of a coincidence even for Sherry Down. Right. What you think... And she lowers her voice and just checks over her shoulder. Well, you think all that, you know, crab stuff was was them lot? Well, they they said they were going places. They said they wanted to do something big. Um, yeah. I mean, I you know, I I left because they just wouldn't listen to what I wanted to do. But you know, I I was never one for giant crab monsters, and I don't know this. This just seems... I never thought they'd actually do something, though. I thought it was all just chat. But you think you think it might be them? Bloody hell. Well, I don't know who else it would be, you know. If 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 it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then I guess it's a giant crab monster. It's probably a giant crab monster, yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to say. I best look into that, then. I think uh, I think we should keep our eyes open and our ears to the ground. I don't want to rejoin that group, though. Uh, oh, no, absolutely not. Load of um, old busybodies. Yeah, for a start, they won't listen to me, but um, they won't listen to my expertise. But No, I know, you said. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I've said several times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, okay, we've we've just got to keep our wits about us. Let's let's talk around, see, see what we hear. Okay, good idea. And we'd bloody angry if it was them. Uh, me too. Me too. Um, I think I might get their uh, tattoo removed. <laughs> <laughs> I did forget about that. And she plonks his pint down. That was an odd choice. That was a very odd choice, Cal. Well, uh, yeah, it would. Uh, I, I thought it would give me um, give me certain powers, but um, it just 
gave me a rash. Mm. And they still didn't listen to you after that, did they? No, no. You live and learn. You no live and bastards. learn. bastards. And uh, I just take a, a sip off the pint and slip into a sullen silence, brooding. Jess sort of just looks at him, just sort of nods a bit, like taps the bar and moves on. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting at the next bar stool, uh, next to Cal, unseen by Cal, is Kit. And Kit is also looking through a small leather-bound journal. Over the past couple of days, Jess will have seen Kit sort of manifesting this book as a way of explaining or, or, or a way of interacting with all of the information that the two of you took from the creature. Mm. Jess clocks him, but doesn't want to stand staring at him so she just picks up a, a pint glass and a, a cloth and, and stands sort of so he's in her peripheral and just cleans the the glass and and speaks to him in her mind <laughs> <laughs> how how's it going kit well it's there's a lot of it yeah most of it's pretty boring really well it's just stuff isn't it it's just whatever people had in their bank accounts and on their phones. I mean, some of it's interesting, don't get me wrong. I'm looking through finding the juicy bits. I hoped it was going to be something juicy and interesting, otherwise what the hell did we do that for? Well, the way I see it, we've got a couple of things we could do. We know all these people's info. Your, I mean, yours, your dad's, Charlie's, we could help them reconstruct all the stuff that it hoovered up out of them. Yeah. We could help them with their, you know, proving stuff to the bank because we can supply their account numbers that they can't remember and have disappeared off their statements and all of those kinds of things to prove who they are and that could really help them. Yeah, I mean... I could get some better shifts out of it. I mean, if we could come up for a reason why I had all their information. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you have to, you have to know there was an awe coming. Right. Oh, go on. Well, we know stuff about all these people. And, you know, some of them, you and I are, bit, are, are pretty mad at. Mm. Your dad shouted at you. Mm. Charlie was a shit you know, always giving you the bad shifts, wanted you to open up, even off. What, what, where does he get off still being concerned about the, the park after he just got gnashed up by that thing? Oh, man's a loser, isn't he? First thing on his mind is, what can we get Jess to do? For God's sake. I mean, I'm totally unappreciated by him. He has no idea how hard I work. Exactly. You are worth more than any of them. <laughs> You're better than all of them. And... We've got tools that we could use to prove it. Right. Oh, I don't know, Kit. You have a think. And if you need to ask, if you need to bounce any ideas, I'm here. There is just one other thing. And I bet you've noticed it. What? All of the stuff it was hoovering up. All of the numbers and the pictures and the data and the usernames and blah, 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 blah. It was all, it's, it's food to that thing, right? Mm. And you know, some food's tastier than other food. Right. Have you noticed there's a pattern to the things it found the tastiest? Uh, and she's going to sort of bluster a bit. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, I thought there was something. Go on, wh wh what is it that you see? It's, it's our friend Melody, isn't it? And uh, just sort of starts a bit. It's not what she was expecting. And she looks at him. What, what about her? Kit shows you the, the book, like flicks through the pages. And one of the pages, like it appears to be paper as, as they're flicking through it. But the pages that it opens at, you see... A photo as if on a mobile phone screen just mm. sort of planted there on the page 
it's a it's a selfie someone's taken in melodies they're holding up a an album cover and melody is just visible in the back corner by the checkout and kit flips through a few more pages and opens on a bank statement which sort of unfolds from the page as you're looking at it and it's sort of like it's on the page but it's also in your own memory Mm -hmm. and jess knows that there is a transaction in on this bank statement that took place in melody's shop and you sort of feel the connections in your memory from the data dump leading from that to records of ownership to melody herself and kit says anything anything to do with her it really like the taste of oh my god i i'm gonna have to talk to her about this i'm gonna have to could be important information so just just make sure you don't give it away for free right um yeah i know kit and i know and i do agree and thank you but it's melody right it it's melody i gotta tell her like she would for me so yeah she's different yeah sure of course she would well yeah all right kit thanks And curtain. That's our story. Woo! Thank you, everybody. Vigil, a main house production from Merely Role Players. It stars Ellen Gould as Jess Butterworth, Chris McLennan as Ed Kincaid, Helen Stratton as Melody, and Chris Buxey as Calisteria Softbinding. Sound design for this production is by Natalie Winter, and the theme music is by Alexander Pankhurst. I'm Matt Boothman, and I play the supporting cast, as well as editing and producing the episode. We were playing Monster of the Week, a role-playing game by Michael Sands, published by Evil Hat Productions. You can find Monster of the Week at genericgames.co.nz. Merely Role Players is a foggy outline production in association with Blackshaw Theatre Company. Until next time, if drama be the food of life, play on! Shall we name the person that has, that you have to phone about this? Yeah, I guess so. This is someone who, for whatever reason, set, basically created this department to house me. Because, <laughs> because it was of what pretty much of a public to do to fire me, and they could just stick me in the basement answering calls from quacks. So could they're they not expecting a... any actual monsters, I don't think. Could they just have a one-letter code name? Yes, <laughs> yes that's what we need. <laughs> yeah. So which is the most shit letter? Yeah. Uh, y is pretty bad. <laughs> Why? The 24 yeah. previous leaders of the department. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that you'd have to pick up the phone to them and go, hello, why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, why? <laughs> why? I, I feel you like... For that as well. Are you... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I really like that suggestion of it being you, just because hello you is a little bit, it, there's, like shade, darling. there's shades yeah. of darling to it that yeah. I really enjoy. <laughs> hello you. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, Brilliant. let's do that. <laughs>